Can you guys hear me okay? Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank the organizers for, for inviting me to give a talk here. And this is my first time. I'm quite excited. I've always been following Bosk uh, talks on Twitter. Uh, so it's good to be in, here in person. So my name is Ravi Madhuri. I'm a computer scientist at Argonne National Laboratory and a, uh, a fellow at the University of Chicago. Um, so my talk has uh, kind of two uh, sections, I suppose. One is um, I'll talk about um, what, rep uh, what reproducibility is and um, what are some of the tools that we developed that would uh, make it easy for researchers uh, to make their own research reproducible um, and be, uh, follow the FAIR guidelines for, uh, for data management and analysis. Um, and I'll also talk about a case study that we, uh, we created um, we did, and, and uh, in, in the process of publication, that will help um, um, make a case in a scientific uh, use case. So uh, again, this, this work has been possible by a lot of people in my team at ISB, at Institute of Systems Biology, at University of Southern California, Oregon, and University of Chicago. Um, it's a... Uh, um, it's a 15-minute talk, but there's been a lot of work that went into making this uh, uh, this analysis that we have done uh, for for on the Uncode data completely reproducible end to end. Uh, the talk that Fernando gave this morning completely resonated with me uh, because um, it is uh, it is really really hard to you know uh, after you do your analysis to kind of think okay let's make this reproducible. Uh, we are. Uh, we spent three months uh, and did this analysis a few times, uh, just to make sure that we captured every single detail that is needed in order for somebody to uh, reproduce it on demand. And especially thanks to Ian Foster. Um, so Ian wrote a bunch of code just to kind of make sure that all of these data sets, data objects and analysis uh, uh, that we've done on ENCODE data is reproducible on demand uh, for somebody who is not involved in, in actually doing the analysis. Um, so th this is probably not a new slide for, for this audience. There's a, uh, um, you know, a reproducibility crisis in science that uh, one of the interesting uh, things that this, uh, this article in, in The Economist talks about is that uh, there's all these experiments and all these uh, results that people haven't been able to reproduce. And, you know, folks are familiar with all the retractions that are happening more recently because of, uh, uh, of irreproducibility of these results and selective uh, statistical selective uh, selections on, on results. Um, one of the things that I found interesting when I was reading about reproducibility crisis in science uh, with the, one of the articles that Nature has published um, is this quote in the article. Uh, and it kind of also resonated with Fernando's uh, uh, statement about uh, reproducibility is like brushing your teeth. You want to make sure you brush your teeth every day so that you, you could avoid root canal. Um, that's a picture of my daughter. She's, uh, she, she's now three, but when she was, uh, when, she, when we were trying to get her teeth brushed, uh, it, it was uh, memorable mornings where she cried and it was not easy. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that reproducibility, uh, even with best intentions, uh, without any good tools that one could use, uh, is non-trivial challenge. And, uh, and it, it is uh, also what reproducibility means is different for different people. And, and there's a lot of different ways people interpret what reproducibility is. So um, one of the things that, that worked for our, for our advantage was that uh, there has been some uh, published work. Uh, Victoria Stodden was mentioned this morning. Um, Sanvey, uh, Anton, and James, uh, and uh, Howick uh, wrote this PLOS article on the top, like 10 simple rules that would make uh, your research computational reproducible. Uh, so we kind of use this as a guiding principles uh, on making the analysis that we have done in this collaboration 
uh, completely reproducible end to end. So these rules are out there. I'm not going to read them off of the slide, but uh, they're, they look simple. Um, but when you're doing some real science that involves multiple collaborations and terabytes of data, um, there's actually a lot of work that goes into making sure you're following these principles. Um, again, um, reproducing hello world, hello world like operations across the multiple languages is a trivial thing, but reproducing real science that involves multiple collaborators and terabytes of data uh, across uh, multiple institutions is a non-trivial challenge, and uh, it only gets worse um, without any proper tooling uh, that will help researchers to, to do this. Uh, fortunately, for um, there's uh, NIH Commons, uh, which is uh, uh, a sort of an effort that uh, started at NIH. Um, and uh, this is uh, Vivian Bonazzi, who's uh, the program manager, program director for the, for the NIH Commons. Uh, they, you know, they had a bunch of workshops and had uh, people come up with uh, with sort of a, a, a sort of a nomin, nominal architecture or, or some guidelines uh, that would um, that would uh, that would help uh, folks to uh, think about how they could manage their data and analysis uh, in a way that uh, that that is uh, that adheres to fair principles, which makes data findable. Um, accessible, interoperable, and reusable um, across multiple uh, sci multiple scientific domains. So um, the the fair principles are sort of embedded in the digital object compliance, the the vertical bar. And as you can see, there's um, there are a lot of different parts into this. And uh, in in the analysis that in the case study that I'm going to talk about, uh, we had we had to create new tools. Uh, new um, methodologies that would allow uh, a researcher to uh, to do this uh, work in a reproducible way uh, in accordance with the FAIR principles. So our approach uh, was to sort of uh, um, have this continuous fairness. Uh, we kind of went by this code by jo uh, Sir John Silston, uh, there's no point in wasting good thoughts on bad data. Um, essentially, the idea is that right from the conceptual conceptualization or a hypothesis to results, you have to have tools and frameworks and services that will help you uh, implement, uh, do your research in a reproducible manner and to make your data and analysis products uh, in, in accordance with the, with the FAIR principles. Um, we also wanted to, uh, we had a, uh, the idea of sustainability of the infrastructure in mind. Uh, so we built all of these tools on existing uh, infrastructure elements so that, um, so that there's a good chance of these tools to be sustainable in the longer term. Uh, so one of the first things that, uh, because we are a multi-institutional collaboration, uh, this, this work that I'm presenting, uh, one of the first things we had, to, uh, we had to resolve was authentication. And we leveraged uh, Globus authentication, which is based on a uh, standard called OpenID, uh, uh, OpenID Connect, uh, which allows for flexible uh, federated authentication that allows researchers from ISP to be able to log into infrastructure that we created and be able to look at the data, validate the results uh, without us having to create a username and password for them. It also helped us create an audit trail that helped us to understand how, uh, who, who are the different uh, program, uh, people and programs that touch the data uh, so that we have a very strong audit trail uh, in order to uh, ensure reproducibility. Uh, so the Globus uh, software is a, um, it's a high performance data management uh, service that uh, we run and operate at the University of Chicago. Um, it's uh, a lot of people, uh, science uh, communities use it across uh, uh, in high energy physics, climate modeling. Uh, we recently started getting more and more adoption in life sciences. It, it allows researchers to move large amounts of data from one point to another reliably and securely without having researchers uh, writing scripts or, or babysitting their transfers. Um, there are two important elements that came out of this, uh, this continuous fairness experiment that we've done. Uh, one is uh, this minimal identifiers, uh, which are uh, these identifiers that allowed us to uh, 
easily track data products, uniquely identify them, uh, uh, generate an identifier, and attach a checksum to that identifier for the data product, which allows us to vouch for the mutability of the data product that we generated. Um, and they're easily created, de-referenced. Uh, we are using something called ARC identifiers as our uh, identifier service itself uh, to generate the GUIDs. The other important element that came out of it is the BD bags, which is, um, again, uh, the, the, the case study that we have has a collections of data sets that are, um, so, so the BD bag is essentially a mechanism that allows you to pass around portable data objects that are uniquely identified by min IDs across multiple systems uh, and also to watch for, for their immutability. So wherever possible, I tried to put a link so that you could go and look for, for it uh, or read more about it. Uh, we also created uh, workspaces. Uh, Globus Genomics is a, is a service that we run to do large scale analysis on Amazon Cloud. So the service uh, uses uh, min IDs and BD bags and has Galaxy workflows that take these BD bags and run this analysis at scale. And at the same time, track the provenance of what analysis are run, what versions of tools were used, um, what intermediate data sets were created. We also created unique identifiers for all of the intermediate data sets so that when we publish this paper or, or a research artifact, somebody could essentially follow everything we've done and play it back on demand uh, when they need to. We implemented a cost aware uh, resource uh, allocation so that when you run analysis on the cloud, uh, we used uh, a lot of Amazon uh, spot instances to run this analysis at scale. Uh, you could do it with, uh, with less uh, cost. Uh, again, uh, one of the main notions is to make data findable. Um, uh, so we created interfaces to make it easy for researchers to find the digital objects we created using metadata. Um, and uh, we have search capabilities that allows researchers to do this. Let me just uh, quickly go through this uh, to, the, to the case study. Um, the, the, the science that we tried to enable was to create this uh, atlas of transcriptional factor binding sites from the ENCODE data sets. Um, and this was, uh, so there are two preprints uh, on BioArchive, so I put them up in case uh, I run out of time. Uh, you can actually go look at them. Uh, the, 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 the first preprint talks about the science and how this, uh, at, this atlas has been created. And the second one talks about some of the tooling and, uh, that we created in order to make this uh, atlas uh, and, and this whole uh, uh, experiment completely reproducible. Um, so let me quickly go through the, uh, the analysis. Uh, the idea is that you know, we, we have multiple uh, uh, footprinting algorithms that have different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so ENCODE has this huge, amount, uh, huge DNS hypersensitivity data that we want to reanalyze it and, and generate this atlas using multiple footprinting algorithms. Um, so there are three algorithms that have relatively different uh, strengths and weaknesses. One of the interesting thing that uh, we, we also got a, a credit uh, from NIH from, for cloud credits and Amazon was kind enough to give us some research credits. Uh, one of the things that happened was uh, one of the postdoc who was working with me on it said that, well, this, we want to run all three of them, not just one. Uh, now that we have credits, it will make us easy, it will make it easy for us to run all three and to generate very comprehensive atlas. And we were able to do it um, very easily. So this is uh, uh, like the notional picture of the analysis uh, pipeline itself. And if you see, all of, the ident all of the data products have unique identifiers. Uh, so these are identifiers called minimal identifiers that I talked about. And they have an acron they have a URL associated with them. And you go to that URL and you can download uh, this, uh, all the data products. They're all BD bags, which is uh, the, uh, the data format that I talked about. And we have tooling that helps you validate um, checksums on, on these BD bags and identifiers. So all of the analysis pipelines, Galaxy workflows, the containers that we created, all of them also have uh, um, uh, unique identifiers and, and that you could uh, resolve and, and get them to rerun the workflows. Um, and then there are, there are scripts that we have created. 
uh, to get the, the, uh, the uh, hits. Um, and all of them, again, they're all available openly um, and, that, and have unique identifiers to capture the right versions and the parameters that we have used to run this analysis. So these are the, if you take the min ID and you, um, you put it in a browser, you get a landing page that describes uh, where the data is, what the checksum is, and who created it, uh, et cetera. Uh, we created interfaces to make it easy uh, on existing data resources like ENCODE to create identifiers. Um, so this, this interface takes an ENCODE query and generates a BD bag of raw data uh, that you could give to Globus Genomics to do the analysis. Um, so these are the, the data sets that we have analyzed. Uh, very detailed uh, how long it took, how many samples are there. Um, what, how long it took to the alignment, and um, the total analysis took around 70,000 core hours to, to do it end to end uh, for all of the samples, all of the 193 sam biological samples available in the ENCODE project. And we have all of this data results in a Postgres database available on Amazon RDS that anybody can use uh, to do their own science. Uh, we created a, a, a very comprehensive GitHub repo with instructions that, uh, uh, that one can follow. We had a third party uh, who hasn't uh, taken part in this uh, work with us to validate these uh, this instructions uh, and essentially um, uh, do make this completely reproducible and, and validate it. So some of the lessons we learned in this process is that um, you know, making research reproducible requires a lot of discipline and, and patience, especially when you have uh, multiple teams working on, on the project. And it is not something you decide after you did the analysis or after you have done your science. You have to kind of think about it right from the beginning, plan for it, and make sure that there's no rogue R script that somebody has written and nobody can find it. And it usually happens, you know, people do things like this. Um, and uh, if you have a bigger team, the complexity exponentially explodes because there's a lot of communication overhead com you know, that, that goes along with this. And one of the important problems that we currently face is the data life cycle problem. Now we have a four terabyte uh, RDS database that sits on Amazon. Uh, and we don't know, I mean, right now it's uh, the Amazon grant is paying for it, but who's gonna pay for it? What is the sustainability model for these data products? And what is the sustainability model for the infrastructure that is built uh, for, this, uh, for this analysis? So that's, uh, that's all my talk. I have a lot of uh, uh, cloud credit programs at NIH to thank for, a lot of NIH grants and DOE grants that, uh, that helped us uh, to do this work. Thank you.